O Father, may your will, made known in Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, reign in us through Mary. Amen. Amen. Holy Spirit, Mother Mary, unite us to Jesus in every moment, that together we may live in the heart of the Trinity, in the will of the Father, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus said to the crowd, For a little while longer the light is among you, Walk while you have the light, so the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. So how do we become children of light? Jesus just told us. He said, Believe in the light so that you may become children of light. So we become children of light by believing and knowing and trusting in Jesus Christ and in his word as it has been believed and proclaimed in the Catholic Church from the beginning. Anything else is darkness. So in the next few minutes, I want to share with you the way that the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary have laid bare the secrets of their interior life to holy men and women of the 20th century and the 21st century so that we can understand how they lived their lives interiorly on earth and so that we can cooperate more effectively with the Holy Spirit so that he can transform us into that perfect interior likeness of Jesus and Mary. But first, I have to take a moment to shatter a myth that most Catholics in the United States believe, including probably some of us in this room, because believing in this myth will make it very difficult for you to understand the new and divine holiness. Now, we all know that the framers of the United States Constitution met here in Philadelphia. And virtually all of those men believed in this myth. It's articulated very well by Thomas Jefferson in these words that he wrote almost exactly 200 years ago. He said, laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths discovered and manners and opinions change, with the change of circumstances, institutions must advance also to keep pace with the times. We might as well require a man to wear still the coat which fitted him when a boy as civilized society to remain ever under the regimen of their barbarous ancestors. But were all of our ancestors barbarous? At the same time that Thomas Jefferson was writing those words, our Lord Jesus Christ showed to blessed Anna Catherine Emmerich the life of our first ancestor, Adam. And this is what he showed her, and this is what she saw. The first man was an image of God. He was like heaven. All was one in him. All was one with him. His form was a reproduction of the divine prototype. He was destined to possess and to enjoy earth and all created things, but holding them from God and giving thanks for them. I saw Adam's heart very much the same as in the men of the present day, but his breast was surrounded by rays of light. In the middle of his heart, I saw a sparkling halo of glory. In it was a tiny figure, as if something, as if holding something in its hand. 
I think it symbolized the third person of the Godhead. Were all of our ancestors barbarous? If you think that that was just an isolated private revelation of a mystic, every single doctor and saint of the church who had private revelations approved by the church pertaining to the original state of Adam describes him in exactly the same way. Listen to St. Hildegard of Bingen, doctor of the church. When God created Adam, divine radiance surrounded the clay substance of which he was formed. That the way this lump of clay appeared on the outside as an outline of its parts after its shape had been given to it, but inside it was hollow. Then from the same mass of clay, God created inside of the figure the heart, the liver, the lung, the stomach, the intestines, and the brain, as well as the eyes and the tongue together with all the remaining organs. When he awoke afterward, he was a prophet of heavenly things, knowledgeable of all powers of the creature and of all arts. God gave over to him all creatures that he might make them his own, because he knew of them and about them. For man represents all creatures. God spoke to Adam in the language of angels, whom Adam understood and knew well. Through God-given wisdom and the spirit of prophecy, he thoroughly knew the nature of all creatures. Did Thomas Jefferson thoroughly know the natures of all creatures? He was a pygmy, intellectually, compared to Adam. But do you know that most of our children and grandchildren in Catholic schools and universities are being taught that Adam didn't even exist as an individual? They're being taught that Adam simply represents man who evolved from subhuman primates. Why is this important? Because what St. Paul said to the Ephesians in the very chapter that Jeanette just read is that God restores all things in Christ. Restores. So what we have to understand is progress is a myth. We have not progressed from Adam and the original state of mankind. Adam and Eve were created in the same, with the same kind of humanity that our Lord Jesus Christ assumed with the Incarnation and that the Blessed Virgin maintained every moment of her life. So we have not progressed. We fell from a great height. And God has bring, been bringing us back so that he can restore what was lost and then bring that to its glorious perfection. So God does not work through an evolutionary process as Teilhard de Chardin and the prophets of the New Age would tell us. He is restoring all things back to the beauty that they had when they came forth from his hands. And the new and divine holiness is the way in which the Holy Spirit is restoring everything back to the way that it was in the beginning, or something very much like it. You know, when Almighty God worked the greatest public miracle since the resurrection on October 13, 1917 in Fatima, how did the Blessed Mother appear at the very end? She appeared as Our Lady of Carmel. 
And didn't Jesus tell Elizabeth Kindleman he wants the flame of love to begin with the Carmelites? But did you ever wonder why Our Lady appeared under that title at the greatest public miracle since the resurrection of Jesus? Well, it helps if you understand the meaning of the word Carmel, because in Hebrew, Carmel means the garden of God, or it could be translated the vineyard of God. But God created this whole world as his garden in the beginning, not just the Garden of Eden. The whole earth was the garden of God before the original sin. And by appearing as Our Lady of Carmel at the end of the greatest public miracle since the resurrection, Our Lady was telling us that through the triumph of her Immaculate Heart, in the era of peace, this earth will become again the Carmel, the Garden of God. And the new and divine holiness is the way that the triumph of the Immaculate Heart will take place in our souls. Now, the new and divine holiness is simply a new and deeper understanding of the divine holiness that Adam and Eve enjoyed before the fall and that our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary lived in every moment of their lives on earth perfectly. And in these times of darkness, where the will of man has exalted itself and attempted to dethrone God and replace him with man, God has poured out his grace by raising up holy men and women, some who were priests, some who were religious, some who were lay people, to whom he has laid bare the secrets of his sacred heart. People like St. Maximilian Kolbe and the servant of God, Archbishop Luis Maria Martinez. People like St. Faustina and Blessed Dina Belanger. People like Venerable Conchita de Armida and Elizabeth Kindleman who were the mothers of big families and then widows. And in the case of Venerable Conchita, a person who has a lay person founded several associations approved by the Catholic Church, including a congregation of priests and a congregation of religious sisters. And what I want to share with you now are the main truths regarding the interior life of our Lord and the Blessed Mother which were, are revealed in the lives and writings of these holy men and women of modern times. And I want to show in a very simple way how you can apply these truths in your own life. And because this is mission impossible in four hours, much less 40 minutes, I have three books in the back of the room which will fill in the outline that I'm going to be giving you in the next few minutes. We work on a suggested donation basis, so if you don't have any money, you can take them as long as you'll read them and share what you learn with others. But if you can make the suggested donation, that's great. One of them is called New and Divine, the Holiness of the Third Christian Millennium. And that is showing how the Holy Spirit has revealed the secrets of the interior life of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Mother through these modern saints. The second book is called The Light Comes from the East and it is about the meaning of the Fatima consecration and what it's really all about and what constitutes the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And the third one is called Genesis Through the Eyes of the Saints which takes the writings of the great mystical doctors and saints whose writings were approved by the church, who were shown 
the original creation and the original holiness of Adam and Eve and what they wrote about it. And it contrasts those writings which agree with what all the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers taught in their authoritative teaching with so many modern ideas of people like Teilhard de Chardin, which are 180 degrees opposed to what God actually revealed about how he created the world and what our first parents were actually like. The interior life of Jesus as presented in the lives of these holy men and women of modern times can be described in terms of four principles, four truths. The first one is that in every moment of our Lord's life, he was totally focused on his heavenly Father and the will of his Father. He told Venerable Conchita, for example, that he did not forget his heavenly Father for one instant from the moment of his incarnation to the moment of his death on the cross. Second point is that from the moment of his incarnation, our Lord abandoned the human will that he had to the will of his Father. The third point is that in every moment, he allowed the will of his Father to reign in his sacred humanity through the Holy Spirit. And this is why, for example, in Mark's Gospel, St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 12, we read the amazing words that the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. <laughs> Jesus is God. And yet he abandons himself so completely to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that in his sacred humanity, the Holy Spirit can move him here and there and everywhere. And he tells Venerable Conchita that every thought, every word, every action, every movement that he made was animated by the Holy Spirit within him. And that brings us to the fourth point, which is that as our Lord abandoned himself to the will of the Father and the action of the Holy Spirit, he was lifted up into eternity and he lived on the one hand in time and space as we do, but on the other hand in eternity and was therefore present to every single creature, past, present, and future, in every moment of his life, in every moment of our lives. And so he was able to make a perfect act of reparation for each and every one of our sins. Not some amorphous act of reparation for all of humanity, but a personal act of reparation for each and every one of our sins. And in addition to that, he showed these holy men and women of modern times that he also then offered to the Father for you and for me, for every soul from the beginning to the end of the world, a perfect act of love for each and every moment of our lives. And every single one of those perfect acts of love was offered up with a threefold intention for the glory of the Father, for the good of all creatures, past, present, and future, and for the coming of the Father's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. The verse that perfectly sums up this last point is in the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10, where St. Paul says to us, you are God's masterpiece. The Greek word is poema, which means something that God made, but it's the word that we get poem from. So you could translate it, you are God's poem. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has prepared beforehand that you might walk in them. Those are the perfect acts of love that Jesus has prepared for you and for me in each and every moment of our lives. 
And what he's told these exemplars of the new and divine holiness in different ways is that those perfect acts of love are suspended in eternity so that you would recognize that Jesus has been the good shepherd. He's gone before you. He's prepared these perfect acts of love for you. And then you will embrace them and do them together with him with the same intention that he has. And you know what he calls a person who does those perfect acts of love from morning till night? He calls that person a living Eucharist. Because he says when one of us does the perfect acts of love that he has prepared for us and we do them with him with the same intention that he has, then we become another humanity for, of Christ. And he says that is the reason why he instituted the Holy Eucharist. He says the Holy Eucharist does not give me anything back. The, the sacred host does not give anything back to me. But my living host gives back to me my very own love. And I instituted the Holy Eucharist so that I could produce my living Eucharist. So how do we apply this in our own lives? The first point, total abandonment to the will of the Father and awareness and orientation of our whole soul to the Heavenly Father. Those are points one and two. Some people have trouble orienting themselves to God the Father because many of us didn't have the greatest relationship with our Father. I know Jeanette in her apostolate helps a lot of people to overcome this problem. But Jesus has also given us a very simple way to overcome it, a childlike way. You remember that when he was said, he was asked, show us the Father, he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And we know that on the Shroud of Turin, we have a photograph of the face of God. And so if we have trouble relating to God the Father, one very simple childlike thing that anyone can do is simply to look at the face, the holy face on the shroud of Turin and talk to God the Father. Because Jesus in his sacred humanity is the perfect image of God the Father who loves you infinitely. But Jesus abandoned the human will that he assumed to his heavenly Father. And so that's what we must do. And how do we do this? Well, first of all, we do it by abandoning ourselves to everything that, has, that God has revealed through the church with regard to faith and morals. We accept it completely, without any reservation, and we practice it as perfectly as we can by the grace of God. But in addition to that, we have to fulfill the duties of our state in life. And we have to understand what those duties are according to the true teaching of the church, not according to what someone may be teaching in the name of the church, but according to the true, defined, authoritative teaching of the church. Let me give you an example of how this can be difficult and why it is so important to make sure that we understand what the church teaches authoritatively in faith and morals. The Catechism of the Catholic Church of 1994 is a wonderful document 
But there are people in the church today who treat it as if it is the complete answer book to every question, and we don't even need to be concerned about anything that was ever defined in the previous 1900 plus years of the Catholic Church. We just open the Catechism of 1994, look up the answer, and that's what we do. That is not Catholic. And I will give you an example of why it is not Catholic. There are, I am not in any way denigrating the Catechism of 1994, far from it. It's very authoritative. I am simply pointing out that even the Catechism of 1994, being based as it is on the defined teachings of the church over 1900 plus years, has to be understood in the light of the whole tradition of the church. And here's an example of why it's so important. The Catechism says many beautiful things about holy marriage that are all true. But there is one very important teaching regarding holy marriage that is not mentioned at all from the beginning to the end. And yet every father of the church, every doctor of the church, every pope who has written an authoritative encyclical on holy marriage has mentioned this teaching as being important. And it is the teaching about the different roles of husband and wife in the family. If, for example, you read the encyclical Casti Canubi in 1930 of Pope Pius XI, he pronounces this teaching, which was the teaching of the church from the beginning, that the husband and father is to be the spiritual leader of his wife and children and that the mother and wife is to be the heart of the family. The man, the husband and father is to be the head of the family. The mother and wife is to be the heart of the family and they're to work together. And the Pope explains as the fathers and doctors did before him. This doesn't mean that the man is supposed to be a tyrant ordering everybody around and exercising a petty tyranny in his home. But it does mean that God has ordained that the husband and father is to exercise spiritual leadership in his home. Is that an important teaching or not? Why is it not mentioned anywhere in the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Now, to show why it is so important to understand any recent teaching, even authoritative teaching, in light of the whole tradition of the Church, let me take it a step further. Pope St. John Paul II wrote many beautiful things about holy marriage. But in one of his writings, he spoke about the mutual submission of the spouses in holy marriage. And I have heard many times people teach as if mutual submission has trumped almost 2,000 years of Catholic tradition and we don't want to hear anything more about the father and the husband having a role of leadership in the family or the wife and mother being called to be the heart of the family because mutual submission is the final word and that has superseded everything that went before. That cannot be. Mutual submission is true but it has to be true in a way that does not contradict everything that went before. Is that possible? Yes, it's very possible. Here's a way to reconcile it very easily. The husband and father must submit himself, lay down his life totally to meet the needs, especially the spiritual, but also the emotional and material needs of his wife and children. But then the wife should submit herself to the authority and the leadership of her husband as the spiritual leader of the family. Obviously, not in sin and not in a way that is denigrating to her dignity, but she should respect and encourage him in his role as the spiritual leader of the family. I mention this because being abandoned to the will of the Father is not just words. 
And if it's going to be made real, it has to be made real according to the true teaching of the Catholic Church. And that means we need to know our faith. And uh, for example, on any point in the Catechism of 1994 where maybe something seems like it's, not that it's wrong, but that, that you, you want to kind of see it in the context of one, what went before, very simple way to do that is to go online and look at the Catechism of Trent. The Catechism of Trent is cited 20 times in the 94 Catechism. It's the most authoritative catechism in the history of the Catholic Church. It has pra been praised by more popes and doctors and great saints than any, all the other catechisms in the history of the church put together. And it will give you an excellent point of reference on any recent teaching where you're, you're just not sure how to understand it in the light of the tradition of the church. Okay, so we know our faith. We know the duties of our state in life. We're committed to doing these things with Jesus. But then we get to the most important part of the adventure. Because if there's one thing that our Lord worked on from morning till night with all of these exemplars from Elizabeth Kindleman to St. Faustina and everyone else, it was fidelity to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because how do you know what is the perfect act of love that Jesus has prepared for you to walk in? <laughs> yes, much of the time you know it because the duty of your state in life dictates that you have to change a diaper now, or you have to pay your bills now, or you have to take your grandchild here or do something else. It's all very obvious then, so you do that with Jesus for the glory of the Father in the name of all creatures and for the coming of the Father's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. But what if you don't have a clear duty? Then you have to rely 100% on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this is the difficult part because many Catholics who have fought hard to keep the faith have done it in a way that involves setting rules and kind of making a spiritual checklist and checking off things on the list. I went to Holy Mass, I prayed my rosary, I did my Divine Mercy Chaplet, I did this, I did that, I did the other thing, I did this, I did this. And so we are so busy checking things off the list that we're not even bothering to listen to what the Holy Spirit is trying to say in our heart. But the whole beauty of the life of these holy men and women is that eventually they got to the point where from morning till night they were listening and they were tuning in and they were doing what the Holy Spirit showed them to do. And that is the most important thing, I think, for us to take away from this conference, that we asked the Blessed Mother to obtain for us the grace to begin to follow the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from moment to moment. And this is usually not something that requires that we be running to our, our confessor or our spiritual director because most of the inspirations that we get are about little things. And so if that little thing that the Holy Spirit inspires us to do doesn't contradict the duties of our state in life, then we should learn to do it but we invent 101 excuses why we shouldn't do it. For example, if we're riding on a plane somewhere and we're sitting next to somebody and the Holy Spirit puts it into our mind to reach out to that person in some way so that maybe we could establish some kind of a relationship which would allow us to lead that person another step closer to God. We find 101 reasons why we don't want to disturb them Maybe they will be annoyed, maybe this, maybe that. And yet, that's the perfect act of love that Jesus has prepared for us to walk in. So if we don't do it, it's not that we've committed a mortal sin and we're going to be cast into the outer darkness, but we have not done that perfect act of love that Jesus prepared for us. And so we are not becoming that living Eucharist that he wants us to be. 
And so this is where I think we should focus part of our prayer. But there's another aspect of this that I want to emphasize. You remember I mentioned that Jesus told these holy men and women many different times, many different ways, that everything that he did on earth, he did in time and in eternity, so that it is still there in eternity. And this explains why the Holy Rosary is so powerful. Because you see, when you enter into the mysteries of the life of Christ, and you understand that you can, by faith, be present to him, and it's real, all of a sudden, the mysteries of the Holy Rosary take on an entirely new dimension. Let me give you a quick example of the power of this. For many years, I went into our county jail with the Legion of Mary, and we had a number of men who converted to the Catholic faith through the prison apostolate, and whenever we went in there, we had the privilege of being locked back in the men's section. We could go anywhere, talk to anybody who would talk to us. And the way we did it, was the first thing we did was we offered them the divine mercy image. Because our Lord told St. Faustina, if someone looks at this image with love, with respect, they will be saved. So if they would accept it, then we had a relationship. The second thing we did, even though we're in the Bible Belt in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, where all kinds of strange notions are floating around about Catholics who worship the Blessed Virgin and everything else, we would immediately teach them the Holy Rosary. And it was very simple. We said, look, everything that Jesus did, he did in time and in eternity. So by faith, if you want to, you can go and be there with Jesus in any part of his life. And we have this beautiful prayer, which is taken completely from the Word of God, and, and we pray this prayer over and over again so that we keep ourselves with Jesus in that mystery. And by being with him in his life, we make it easier for him then to come into our life and be a part of everything that we do. No problem. Everybody understood this. So then we would say, okay, here's the pamphlet with the mysteries. You pick one and we will pray these prayers, and between the prayers, we will read the verses of the Holy Scripture that pertain to this mystery. In all the years that I did this, I never had a single man who didn't pick a sorrowful mystery. And the mystery that was the overwhelming favorite was the agony in the garden. So we would say, we would pray that we would enter into the garden with Jesus, as he sweats blood for us. And I'll just give you one example of the power of praying it this way. There was this young man, he was in there for dealing drugs. He had had two Catholic girlfriends whose parents took them to church on Sunday. He got both of them pregnant, and in both cases, the parents pressured them to have an abortion. We went into the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus, and we read the verses from St. Matthew's Gospel about the agony. And at the end of that one decade, he asked if he could talk to me alone. We always do everything by twos. So I went down to the other end of the cell block and he told me about these two girls and these two abortions. I don't know if he ever told anybody else about it, but I know that from that day, he changed and he began to study the catechism. And then when he was sent to prison to complete his term, the last letter I ever got from him, I, unfortunately, I, I lost contact with him after that. He said uh, he was studying electricity to become an electrician. And he said, for me, everything is God. So those are the kinds of things that happen when we understand through this new and divine holiness understanding what it really means to be present to Jesus in the mysteries of his life, that we can be there with him. And it's real in any mystery of his life, from his incarnation to his resurrection. And it's powerful. And then it helps us to understand that he wants to be part of us in the same way. 
Now, the Protestant evangelicals have these bracelets. You see, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's beautiful. But it's not the new and divine holiness because it's putting Jesus at a distance. So some of my friends who are in the room tonight, when we would have conferences for children, we would make bracelets for them which said W, J, W, S, W, D. Jesus, what shall we do? That is the new and divine holiness, living flame of love bracelet that we should all be wearing, at least in our minds. Jesus, what shall we do? And that is what we should take out of this room tonight and keep asking that question for the rest of our lives. Jesus, what shall we do? And then do it with him, with the same intention that he has for the glory of the Father, for the good of all souls, past, present, and future, and for the coming of the Father's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Father, may your will, made known in Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, reign in us through Mary. Amen. Amen. Holy Spirit, Mother Mary, unite us to Jesus in every moment, that together we may live in the heart of the Trinity, in the will of the Father, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may you spread the effects of the grace of your flame of love over all humanity. Amen. Amen.